right, good morning. Almost end of the morning, you know, just five more minutes before it becomes the afternoon. So welcome to KubeCon. Uh, my name is Arun Gupta, and I work for Amazon. And I'm Raffaele Di Fazio from Zalando. Fantastic. Today we are here to talk about uh, mastering Kubernetes on AWS. We know it's a short session. We'll try to do as much justice as we can. Uh, the slides, the, our recommendations, our guidelines, all of those are publicly available on a GitHub repo. So we'll be happy to share that towards the end of the session anyway with you. So let's get started with that. So I, I work for Amazon. I'm a principal open source technologist. My role is um, I'm a CNCF board member for AWS. And I've uh, been in the containers land for a while. I like to run. I like to do other fun things as well. And I'm, as I said, I'm Raffaele. I work for Zalando. I uh, love the topic of container orchestration and Go and a bunch of other things. And as an Italian, you love wine. Yeah, that's a fact. <laughs> All right, so today, instead of this, we're not expecting this to be a Kubernetes 101, although we have a lot of content around that topic as well, but we're gonna pick three topics, and we're gonna deep dive into those topics, and we're gonna share our recommendations, and the way we have structured the session is, I'll talk about what are we seeing in Amazon, how our customers are using Kubernetes in different scenarios. I was pretty thrilled, I have built actually a personal affection for Game of Thrones now, because it runs Kubernetes on AWS, so that is pretty cool. I learned quite a few things from that session. But we'll also share a broader perspective what our customers are doing it. And then Raffaele will talk about it exactly. Practices are good, but here is how we run it in an opinionated way. So now we, hopefully you'll get a good balanced view of it. And the three topics we chose is, how do you set up your cluster? How do you do identity and access management you know, using Kubernetes? And then finally, the visibility or telemetry, you know, there are lots of names for this. Let's get started. So what are your choices if you are running, pardon for my voice, actually, I've been talking too much here. So, but what are your choices when you are trying to set up a Kubernetes cluster? Um, what does that mean, really? You know, how do I install a cluster? How do I operate a cluster? How do I upgrade a cluster? How do I deploy an applications to it? What are my choices? Well, deploying is simple because that's kubectl. That's your CLI, essentially. Or maybe some IDE or Maven package and all. But we'll focus primarily on the cluster setup itself. Now, if you are a developer, you, know, you want to set up a single node Kubernetes cluster, uh, Minikube is a credible um, option today. You can download Minikube, it starts using hypervisor or virtual box, and it spins up a single node, single worker, single master cluster on your machine. And you can interact with it using kubectl, all of that works pretty good. Um, Docker at DockerCon also announced that Docker Desktop will also have integration of Kubernetes in there. I'm still waiting. I'm a Docker captain, so I'm still waiting for those bits to come into my hands so that I can start trying it out as part of Docker for Mac. That brings a more seamless experience, essentially, because you know, from your Java files or whatever your language files are, you go build a Docker image using Docker for Mac, and then you use kubectl, so you already have Docker for Mac. Why download a new tool? So that's kind of cool. On the community side, <clears throat> there are 18 different ways you can actually deploy Kubernetes on AWS. Uh, I'm not gonna list all of them, but one of the favorite ones that we have seen a lot of our customers use is COPS. Uh, this tool is actually built uh, in the community by AWS SIG, essentially. So huge props to Justin Santa Barbara and Chris Love, you know, who are the main maintainers, and a bunch of other people as well who have been maintaining this tool. Really slick and easy, and I'll show an example of how COPS really work. If you are looking for a complete list on the 18 different ways and other flavors, look at Kubernetes AWS.io. At reInvent last week, we introduced EKS, which is Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes. That is a managed service from Amazon. Uh, you go to uh, Amazon console or AWS console, say, give me a cluster, and we give you an API URL, and that's it. Now, we take care of managing the cluster. We'll talk about that. There are other options by CoreOS Tectonic and Red Hat OpenShift, which runs an opinionated view of Kubernetes because it provides a lot of tooling on top of Open, um, Kubernetes as well. Last but not the least, there is, of course, um, CloudFormation. We see a lot of customers using CloudFormation because they really want to handcraft how their cluster is set up, how their networking policy looks like, and then Terraform, of course, is another option. So these are some of the options that we see that our customers use primarily between one of these. And then, of course, we have partners. So Docker, Heptio, Mesosphere, they all provide recommendations on how do you build and run these applications. Um, now, let's take a look at it, COPS, a little bit. So what is COPS? Well, COPS is community-supported. It is primarily built, as I said, as part of SIG AWS. 
Uh, it's a top-level Kubernetes project. So github.com slash Kubernetes slash cops is where you get all the details over there. Uh, there are cops office hours, a Slack channel. There is no production support if you're interested in that. You know, you are on your own. You're really relying upon a Slack channel and all, but it's, that channel is very active. Uh, it can also optionally generate uh, CloudFormation or Terraform scripts in case you need to. So then you can take that as a starting point and then deploy your cluster using that. Uh, as I said, this is a top-level um, project. Let's take a look at the CLI for this. Now, how does, how does this work? Well, you, need, you are deploying your COPS cluster in a region with three availability zones. You, know, you are looking at a master with high availability. Uh, what that means is you are deploying three masters and each master also has a co-located HCD with it. Uh, so essentially what I'm saying is my availability zones in this case are US East 1B, 1A, 1B, 1C, or in this case 1B, C, and D. COPS also stores the cluster state in an S3 bucket, so I'm exploiting the environment variable, and then I say, okay, I'm gonna create a cluster. In this case, I'm just giving the cluster name as cluster.cates.local, and just by giving cates.local, I don't need to do any DNS setup, et cetera. It uses gossip protocol to discover the nodes among themselves. It uses weave networking for that, weave mesh essentially, and it creates a cluster. And then I'm specifying my master count, my master instance type, my node count, my node instance type. I can provide different kinds of networking um, availability here. In this case, I'm using Calico, but there is work going on already in the next version of COPS by which you can actually use the CNI plugin that we released last week. And then essentially you say, now go create the cluster. Let's talk a little bit about ECS, or EKS actually, Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes. So uh, what we give you as part of that is essentially a managed control plane. You know, our customers have come to us and told us, run Kubernetes for me so that I can focus on my applications. So, and that's what it's giving you. We, you come to, you know, you use AWS console or CLI and say, create a cluster for me. We create a cluster, you know, and we give you an API URL. Worker nodes are in your account. The master is in our account. You bring your own worker nodes. We give you cloud formation templates. We give you pre-built armies. You take those armies and you say, you know, bring those armies and connect that to the server, and then you're good to go. And then we automatically scale the master for you, depending upon the number of pods, number of requests that are coming in. We automatically scale the cluster. We give you option to manually update the cluster, upgrade the cluster, or automatic upgrade the cluster. So let's look at the core tenets for what are the core tenets for EKS. Well, the first thing is, in a very classical Amazon way, availability, reliability, security, all the illities that you are aware of, you know, that Amazon gives you, you know, from AWS, that is what we give you exactly. You can run your full enterprise grade production workloads on EKS because we are doing all the heavy lifting for you. One of the most important tenets, and I mean, they're all equally important, but one of the ones that I'm super excited about is we're gonna provide an upstream, 100% upstream experience. What that means is you have your Kubernetes cluster running on premise, you run, build the application over there, you can just switch your kubectl config and say now I'm gonna talk to this cluster and deploy my applications over there. So whatever the upstream experience is gonna be, there is no forking, there is no private branches running, all the work is gonna be done in upstream. So you can literally bring your own upstream cluster and say now I'm gonna deploy to EKS and we'll take care of it. We will provide deep integration with the rest of the AWS stack, so IAM integration, for example with kubectl, we'll provide deep integration with that. Uh, IAM integration on the pod runtime, we'll provide with that with CloudWatch, CloudTrail, you know, with X-Ray, all of those integrations will be there, but those are completely optional for you to use. You know, I mean, that's what our customers like, so we provide those integrations, so if you wanna use them, they're ready for you. Now this is the tenet that I am super excited about because we are changing the company culture here. We are gonna be actively contributing to Kubernetes project. And what that means is all the work that's gonna be done in EKS, the managed control plane, that is gonna be ours, but literally you know, be fully compliant and done 100% out in the open source. So as a matter of fact, we built a CNI plugin, which allows you to give a secondary IP address from your VPC network to a pod. That work, that CNI plugin, is fully open sourced. So essentially you can take that CNI plugin, plug it into your cluster, and build your own cluster that way. Simple API, um, we're gonna say, we can say AWS, EKS, 
create a cluster. I can say, give me the cluster name. We're going to provide different version support. And then eventually, you can say, I am IAM role. And that is the IAM role that will be used to authenticate with the cluster. And then it can propagate all the way to the pod. So how does it work? Well, essentially, if you come to us, we say, you can give me a cluster. Um, today, if you are building a cluster, you're saying master and etcd, and then your worker nodes, which are in a different availability zones. You come to EKS, all you get is, you know, all right, we take care of all the heavy lifting for you. We give you a control plane, and then you bring your worker nodes. So the responsibility is a very standard shared responsibility model of AWS. And then those worker nodes are connected to the control plane. We take care of managing the control plane for you. And then you use your standard cube cuddle to deploy the application to the cluster. All right. So um, as I said, I'm Rafael from Zalando. So, um, so now you heard some ways you can actually provision or uh, update your clusters. Uh, what I'm going to tell you now is a little bit like how we do this at Zalando, so really the opinionated way of this presentation, right? Um, before doing that, um, I have to tell you what Zalando is because it might be that you don't know it, um, as we are in, in Texas, and Zalando is actually uh, the largest European fashion company. Uh, this means we sell clothing and all this sort of stuff online, so it's e-commerce, essentially. Uh, to let you understand the scale of the company, I'll just show you some, some numbers. So you operate only in Europe, as I said, in 15 markets. Um, we have some six fulfillment centers, 22 million Arctic customers, and some other numbers. Um, but what is really interesting is that we have 1,900 employees in tech, um, most of which are actually engineers, and they want to deploy their applications. Um, historically, we come from a point where we had an on-premise infrastructure. Um, based on a bare metal setup, in which, of course, we had a limited setup for uh, scaling uh, and for, for example, starting new projects or new teams and starting new applications. Um, moreover, our tooling was entirely custom uh, based on some um, software we developed. Um, we then decided to migrate to the cloud, specifically to AWS, um, to make sure to have um, you know, this high speed, this high velocity for developers and scaling the teams. Um, we, we did that by going to a model where we have essentially C2 instances uh, with an EMI we baked and uh, one single Docker container per instance, which meant that developers needed to understand what was the right instance for them, um, what do they need in terms of uh, resources, and a lot of other things. Um, and we used CloudFormation to deploy that. Um, sequen after that, uh, we decided to migrate to Kubernetes, which allow us, first of all, to have a higher density, so packing all those workloads together, and to give an API that actually makes more sense to our developers and is not and remove them, you know, this need of understanding what is a T2 micro instead of uh, M4 forex large. Um, to give a little bit more context, just so I said, we had smooth, uh, lots of teams. Um, we had when Already when we went to the cloud, something around 200 engineering teams, and each team was in the end responsible as well for, for the CI/CD part and all these kind of things. You heard this morning in the in the in the keynote from Kelsey, just you don't want to deploy from kubectl. So part of this whole um, this whole migration um, uh, to Kubernetes is to enforce compliance and best practices uh, by means of uh, you know making sure that people can only deploy to, to clusters only via a proper CI-CD setup and enforcing these ends-off operations by not having them directly access containers and do random stuff with them. Okay, so let's jump at the, at the Kubernetes cluster setup. So um, currently we have multiple AWS accounts and we provision exactly one Kubernetes cluster per account. And we are managing something around 50 Kubernetes clusters. So as you may imagine, this is not a terribly used, uh, huge number if you are um, Google or Amazon, uh, but it's a pretty, pretty big, pretty big uh, number, cluster number in case you are um, a fashion e-commerce. Um, those clusters are actually um, made, designed to be small, uh, such that we can, for example, limit the impact of possible problem, uh, outages or, or problems with those clusters, and as well with the fact that Kubernetes I don't know what's going on. Uh, code was not optimized to deal with the AWS rate limiting. 
I think about, for example, mounting EBS volumes, it was not used not to be perfect, is improving, but there's still, still a bunch of things to, to do. Um, our setup is strongly based on, on CloudFormation. Um, we use CloudFormation entirely to provision those clusters, uh, and we chose that because, it's, uh, first of all, it's AWS native, so we wanted to have something that could tailor exactly um, um, uh, the cloud we were deploying to, so AWS, and because we have a, a pretty good existing experience inside the company, so we decided let's take the tool that uh, we are familiar with. Um, our setup is based on container Linux. Um, we don't do right now any AMI customization, so we use whatever you can use as well. And we add additional decision that we took, for example, is to use uh, Flannel as networking to support more than 50 nodes. Amazon now is jumping on this on on the ship, so it's helping uh, with the CNI plugin, but it used to be quite tricky to have cluster the more than 50 nodes um, due to a limitation in AWS routing table. Um, for, so as I said, um, we have all these clusters, we use this approach of immutable infrastructure, we don't do updates and reboots of nodes, instead we replace them in a rolling fashion. Um, our cluster setup looks mostly like that, so we have two auto-scaling groups, um, the master is spanning three availability zones as well as the worker nodes, as the worker auto-scaling groups. Um, we run everything ourselves, so also ATD. ATD runs um, also in their own CloudFormation stack, so outside of the master nodes. Um, we use uh, additionally uh, ELB, so this is a classic load balancer in front of the, of the uh, master nodes to achieve the HA setup. And we use this both for the interaction from the kubectl, so the users or the deploy tool, um, and the worker nodes. So as I said, we have 50 clusters. It's quite a, quite a big number. Um, and we have to find a way to operate them in a way that doesn't require us to do this manual operation. It's nice to say your developers cannot uh, deploy to production manually, and then you operate the cluster manually. This doesn't really make sense, right? So what we did is essentially deploying, uh, developing two tools. One is the cluster registry, which contains some metadata for the cluster, so really information, descriptive information of what the cluster should look like, and a reference to the configuration of this cluster, which, by the way, is open source. You'll find it on GitHub.com. Um, and the tool that just watches this configuration and applies this by means of a CloudFormation stack and some additional AWS resources. So I am. All right, All right let's, talk about, <clears throat> let's talk about IAM. Now, IAM is the way how AWS customers understand you know, how to do security and how do they do access management. So let's talk about how does IAM work. You know, it really enables access to AWS resources. Um, when you create a COPS-based cluster, essentially what happens is there are two IAM roles created for you, one for master nodes and one for worker nodes. And the policies that are attached to them are a bit different, and which is by design, because the capabilities that master needs to have are a bit more, essentially. Um, now, what we need is a little bit more granular control for kubectl and pods, because essentially, you know, if you think about it, your kubectl relies upon kubeconfig to talk to your master, but there is no IAM integration over there. I want to be able to say, use this IAM to authenticate with the cluster, because that's sort of the language that AWS customers are used to. And then when you are running the pod, you want to see that, what is the IAM role that the pod can take at the runtime so that the policies can be applied accordingly? So let's take a look at it. Now, for the IAM role to kubectl, uh, our customers like to are looking at uh, Authenticator. That's something that we are also looking at as part of EKS service, essentially. And what it gives you is it's a project by Heptio Labs, which is one of, one of our good partners. And essentially, if you look at it, there is a kubectl, there is a Kubernetes cluster running, and then in AWS environment, we have AWS auth service running here. Okay? So the kubectl passes the AWS identity, which is basically an IAM role. It passes it on. Remember, we saw the role or name. So we pass that role, IAM role, to the Kubernetes cluster. The Kubernetes, <coughs> excuse me, the Kubernetes cluster then talks to the AWS auth service that, okay, this is the um, IAM role. This is sort of what um, policies that are available. It gets the policies back. Authentication is done using AWS auth, and the authorization is done using the RBAC that is baked into the Kubernetes cluster itself. And then accordingly, the action is allowed or not allowed. So that's sort of how authenticator model works. Let's take a look at it from the IAM identity for the pod itself. 
Now, if you look at today, the pod, if, if it wants to do something within the EC2 instance, it'll talk to the EC2 metadata service, that I want to do this, can I do this or not? Cube2IAM is a project that has been extremely popular, which basically gives you the ability to assign an IAM role to a pod. And it says, okay, take this role. So let's see how that works. Now, my same setup here. First thing what we do is we set up a Cube2IAM as a daemon set that gets set up. Now, the pod, there's a secure token service that is also running back in AWS. Now, the pod, when it's trying to talk to the EC2 metadata service, the call is intercepted by the daemon set. That daemon set then guides it to the secure token service, figures out, okay, this is the IAM role that is assigned to the pod, what are the policies that are applicable to it, and then it makes a call to the EC2 metadata service. So the whole pod being, you could assign a pod IAM role to the pod at the runtime, and you can use an IAM role at the kubectl level as well. Both are possible. And the way um, IAM role is assigned to the pod is literally just an annotation here. So I have my deployment here, and in here, all I'm saying is this is my IAM role. I give my IAM role R in here, and there it goes. Now, Cube2 IAM uh, is a great project. It has done a great job, but there are certain issues with it. You know, I mean, it requires really the node to have an assume role capability, which is a much wider capability. So that's one of the projects that we are looking to actively contribute to, because essentially that's the capability that we are looking our customers will continue to use. So that's the project where the EKS team will contribute back in the open source and see how we can make it better. There are other ways you know, by which our customers are looking at, at as well on how to create those temporary IAM credentials. So HashiCorp Vault is one of the offerings that our customers like to use because you can essentially generate temporary IAM credentials from a Vault server running either on premises or in the cloud, and that's certainly a possibility. And in the long run, uh, we are also looking at Spiffy, essentially, that which allows you to do identity propagation across different clouds, across different container orchestration, is independent of the container runtime. And we are particularly excited because it's not really tied to Kubernetes or ContainerD or any other runtime, because then it can bleed into other CNCF projects as well. So the possibilities of Spiffy, even though it's still a futuristic thing, are pretty huge. So um, talking about IAM and Zalando, we actually have to first of all distinguish between two different systems. So um, we talk about AWS IAM, and we talk about an IAM system that we use in internally for service-to-service -service communication. We run a microservice infrastructure and employee-to-service communication. Regarding AWS IAM, we use Kube2 IAM as a daemon set in a very similar uh, fashion to what Arun already shown. Um, and, but the interesting part is actually uh, why this works for us, right? So why uh, this is actually reasonable for us. So we, we put this annotation, as you've seen, uh, into those deployments. So and why do we trust people to actually do that? And what does it work for us? It works for this idea of polarized principle. So as I said, no deployments happen uh, manually to production. It always happens through a version YAML. And this YAML has to be, those configuration needs to be approved. And this means uh, whenever two engineers actually are saying, OK, this is right, this is the role we need, this is fine for us. Um, talking about the other IAM system, so which here I'm calling platform, uh, I'm, um, as I said, we run a microservice infrastructure. We have hundreds of microservices. They talk to each other, uh, providing OAuth tokens. As well, uh, as employees, they also use OAuth tokens to communicate with some of those services. Um, we wanted, first of all, um, to make sure that employees could use the same tokens they were used to use in this infrastructure, uh, for example, to, um, to talk with the Kubernetes API server. Um, we did that by a natural extension points of the Kubernetes API server that maybe you're familiar with, which is the webhook. Essentially, whenever you do kubectl, whatever you do, get pods, um, if you pass a token, this will be this will arrive to the API server and the API server. Whenever you have in, you are in this uh, webhook mode for authentication authorization, this token will be passed uh, to a webhook, which is in the end a custom software that you can write. And this uh, this webhook in our case is responsible for uh, validating this token and uh, verifying that the user is actually uh, authorized to do uh, anything that needs to be done. Um, 
All right, so this is for users talking with systems, right? So with APIs. But what about uh, those, um, uh, those uh, applications that needs to talk with each other? For that, um, we extended Kubernetes by means of a custom resource definition. Um, which is um, which, uh, and it's a small system which is called, in this case, credentials provider. What does it? What the system do is, in the end, is like the user will just uh, create this custom resource definition and say, I want these credentials, these tokens for my for my application, and this system will just read from the Kubernetes API this uh, desire of having tokens, and uh, it will talk with the internal uh, IAM infrastructure that we had before Kubernetes and it will write back a Kubernetes secrets to the API. This means in this case that we, the application can really use a native Kubernetes concept, which is a secrets. We are pretty handy to, to mount inside your pods, and with that we are integrated, and they are happy to just use the tokens. All right, so let's move to the last topic, visibility. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about visibility in a cluster. I mean, if you look at it, you know, in terms of the visibility of the cluster, if I look on the top, there are five different aspects that we see that are important for a cluster. You want to see the end-to-end -end logs, you know, logs coming from different sources. Uh, you want to see the metrics, you know, that, okay, how is my node doing? How is my pod doing? You want to take a look at events, you know, if my node is going down, my cluster is going up, what's really happening over there? You want to have alerts, you know, you want to have some alert-based auto-scalers, you know, rigging up. And then eventually you want tracing, which is end-to-end -end tracing of an application. So those are sort of five different visibility aspects that we think about it. Now those five aspects are really coming from four different sources, essentially, if you look at it. There is, of course, a cluster, which is sort of an Uber concept, then there's a node, and then within the node is where your container is running, and then within, in between that, there's a concept of an application. So the point being, if you're looking for a visibility in a Kubernetes cluster, in general, in an AWS concept is, this is what you are really looking for. You know, make sure your matrix is checked off that you know, in all rows and all columns. Now, let's take a look at logs. Well, the logs, of course, the e easiest way people look at it is kubectl logs. That's a rather easy way. That's only the first cut of it. It doesn't give you all the details, all the information. You can get events and things like that as well, but kubectl logs is definitely more popular. The stack that we see a lot of our customers using is the F stack, or Elasticsearch, FluentD, and Kibana. So let's take a look at it, how that combination really works. Well, essentially what you have is a cluster, and this cluster is running in a region in, in two separate availability zones. Okay, keep fading in and out. Are we good? Okay, cool. Yeah. So I have um, the cluster running in two availability zones that are shown in horizontal rows. And then I have auto-scaling groups as well. So essentially two masters, which is not a good design, should really be one or three odd number of masters. And then I have a number of workers over here, okay? So if you were to deploy like a F stack as either a Helm chart or by yourself, then what you will have is a Fluent D deployed really as a daemon set on all of your nodes over there. Once you have it, then essentially the logs from your container are dumped onto the file system, which are then put into FluentD, and that then forward that to um, Amazon uh, CloudWatch logs. So once it goes into the CloudWatch logs, you have an ability to subscribe to an Elasticsearch cluster, which again is running on Amazon uh, itself. Um, so you have an Elasticsearch service. You say any log that comes to CloudWatch automatically send it to Elasticsearch. And on top of that, essentially what you can do is you can set up a Kibana cluster. So that's sort of a F stack that we see a lot of our customers running. Now, there are a lot of different variations for it. That's not the only way, but that is the, one of the more prominent ones that we see. Take a look at metrics, for example. What kind of metrics do we see? Now, there's, of course, Node that gives you a lot of metrics. Node Exporter is a common tool that we see a lot of our customers using in uh, spitting out metrics about the Node itself. In terms of pod slash container, uh, you can look at cube state metrics, you know, that is actually bundled with Kubernetes, or you can be installed depending upon the configuration. C Advisor is a pretty popular tool that uh, developers look at or, or customers look at. And then from the application perspective, let's say if you are a Java developer, if you're building a Java application, you can start exposing your metrics that were done using JMX using slash metrics endpoint. And why slash metrics endpoint? Because essentially what you need is a cluster-wide aggregator. You could use either Prometheus or Heapster as one of those sources you know, to be a cluster-wide aggregator that is actually pulling the data from all the, is scraping the data from all slash metrics endpoint. Now, you do need a data model as well, 
Well, Prometheus is a time series database as well, so you can either store it in there, or you can have a specific InfluxDB or a Graphite database where your data is stored, you know, and then you can run some analysis on top of that. On top of that, you would like to build like an alerting, me alerting mechanism where, okay, now I got all the data now. If my memory threshold goes below a certain number, trigger an alert for me. So you can build either alerting um, your own, or there are plenty of tools available. And last but not the least, what you really need is a visualizer on top of that. There is a dashboard that comes as part of Kubernetes. You can certainly use that. But there, is, there are Grafana, Kibana dashboards. If that is sort of your corporate standard, or that is what you're using in your team, feel free to pick those dashboards. There are plenty of dashboards that are already available that you can use. All right, so we are quick. Um, good. So talking about logging or, uh, at Zalando, so we currently use a centralized login solution. So we don't have a managed stack like that. We use Scalar as our centralized login solution, and we deploy a daemon set, so a pod in each of these nodes that actually just streams this log to this uh, software as a service. Uh, this means this is extremely easy for uh, developers to just port their application. They don't have to care about it. We have this piece of infrastructure. They just stream those logs, and they just need to log to standard up or standard up. Um, regarding monitoring, um, we have an exist existing um, monitoring solution in place since um, many years now. This is called Zmon. Uh, it's actually open source. You find it on GitHub. Um, and what we did essentially when we started migrating to Kubernetes is essentially integrating this system with Kubernetes. So making some of the native uh, Kubernetes resources available from the system. Um, by using Prometheus node exporter to get a system metrics and Hipster to collect pod metrics. What is really important though, um, it's really from the user point of view, right? So um, make sure that the user not only can, they can deploy, right? So most of the discussions around Kubernetes are kubectl deploy something, right? That's easy, but how do you do it like real in production with a compliant system in a way that people can actually monitor everything? So what we do is we integrate with our existing systems and we provide some default uh, checks and alerts for all the applications that are deployed that the teams can actually just, just use. Um, additionally to that, we have an ingress controller and we have some standard metrics regarding latency, um, error rate that people can just reuse to build some proper reporting. All right, so all of this data would not be interesting if you don't have a way to actually have a look at it. We have some custom dashboards. The picture is quite small, but this is actually the dashboard that we use to monitor all these clusters that we run. Um, this means we have some metrics regarding the API server latency, the number of pods, the number of deployment, which is a great indicator in case you are running uh, Kubernetes clusters just to get a feeling of what, what is actually happening. Uh, and then we have some default dashboard for, um, for users that they can actually uh, um, import, clone, uh, to just uh, monitor the memory, CPU usage, uh, latency, and all the other things. All right, so um, this was just, just a quick look at some of the important things that uh, we learned, we discover, and that we recommend uh, regarding Kubernetes uh, on AWS in this case. Um, but there are definitely some more factors to consider. For example, you want to have a look to configure some sane defaults. Kubernetes will not limit the number of pods you can run in a namespace by default, so you want to put a quote on that. Or you want to have a limit range to have some uh, default uh, resource uh, limits for your application. And you want to know your cluster limits. It's easy to say I can run 10 pods, um, but um, as you can see, Kelsey didn't want to even run this 10 million pods that someone asked this morning in the keynote, and there is a reason for that. Um, and you also want to, as well, work on simplifying the user experience by, for example, starting using things like Ingress uh, or external DNS, which is actually an open source project to get some nice DNS name for apps, uh, which we develop and is in the Kubernetes incubator. All right, that was it. Uh, time is over, so I'm not sure which question we can get. So <clears throat> one of the last things that we would like to share with you is this is a workshop that we have been building for past several months now. This is a workshop that we are sharing with our customers, our partners, our developers. If you are new to Kubernetes and you want to get started with Kubernetes on AWS, you, know, you can literally start with this workshop and you can spend a few days literally if you want to go through each chapter end by end. And what we are encouraging is if you don't like something about the workshop, this is done completely in an open source way, submit an issue. 
send a pull request. And that's what we are looking for from you. We are really trying to show all possible ways our customers are using it you know, in this workshop. We want to engage with you. We want to work with you on how we can contribute and make this workshop more successful. So start it. You know, uh, let us know how we can be helpful to you. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to, if you want to talk about disasters, things that went wrong, failures, HCD dying, all this kind of stuff, where I'm outside, there is also other members of my team that would be fun. Thank you.